Hello everyone, I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. I'm honored to have Erica Arley and Christy Ray as my guests this week on the podcast. They are the co-founders of Honeyhead Films, a Wilmington production company that has a mission of telling strong stories from the often overlooked female perspective. The two right now are riding high on the critical success of their first feature film. It's called A Song for Imogene, which has won awards at film festivals all across the United States. Erica and Christy are kindred spirits. They share a deep desire for movie making, and they were brought together, strangely enough, by Craigslist. Erica and Christy, welcome to the one-on-one -on -one with John Evans podcast. Thanks for having Thank us, so John. Much. First, congratulations to the response to a song for Imogene. It is so well deserved. And, you know, being from Wilmington and, and seeing the response that a Wilmington based organization like yourself uh, that you're getting is just, just tremendous. Erica, you wrote and directed the film. Tell me about the response. Has it been overwhelming? Has it been surprising? Has it been vindicating? What's it been like for you? It's been truly a pleasure, John. I mean, this. This was a, you know, slow burn indie drama that puts women, you know, in the foreground, um, so to speak, um, of a cinematic experience for the audience, which I think is just uh, less common, you know, in our industry. Um, and so we weren't totally sure um, what the reception would be like. We felt like we had made a strong film. We had made a film with a lot of heart that meant a lot to Christy and I. but you're you never know um you know apart from your immediate community and our immediate audience um that we knew was there because we have had such great support from our local and regional community um throughout the process of making this film we weren't sure what um communities outside of wilmington and north carolina who weren't as familiar with honeyhead would would think of the film um so it's been really humbling and um encouraging to have the reception we've had for this project. Um, it's been really inspiring and um, we're really grateful that the, the story has touched so many people and made so many other folks, um, men and women feel seen in their own experiences with the same types of issues that Cheyenne, the protagonist who Christy plays is going through. Okay, Christy, what's it been like for you on screen, but also being one of the driving forces behind making this film? It's actually been an incredibly rewarding experience. What Erica was saying about this, this story feeling universal to audiences outside of our region has meant a lot as a creative producer on the project. The film is highly personal to both Erica and myself. Um, so as an actress, it's kind of a vulnerable situation. Um, when you're watching the film with a live audience, you know, standing in the Q&A and hearing people talk about their own experiences, it's been very telling that um, there's just been a gap in storytelling um, to explore women's issues in this way where they're often overlooked in the South. Um, something I love to talk about the project is, is how it was made. You know, it's a miracle that any film gets made these days or just in general, making a movie is really, really challenging. But um, the process of making this movie, I'm really proud of and the crew behind it being almost entirely from North Carolina and our cast being almost entirely from this region as well. It's a true testament to the raw talent that we have above and below the line here in Wilmington and um, the Southeast region. And I love the process that Honey had employed when we were deciding who was going to come along on this journey with us to make this project. Um, it being our debut feature film, Eric and I really took a chance on a lot of people. Our department heads were all first time um, in their positions on a feature film as well. And they took a chance on us. So there was a lot of collective um, trust there. And it was a beautiful experience. We mm -hmm. had 
seven collegiate internships. Um, we were in part financed by a crowdfunding effort. So our community came together to help make this project happen. We were supported in earnest by rental houses and vendors across Wilmington who genuinely want to see Honeyhead succeed. And that mission and that energy has just stuck with the project through its now distribution and film festival circuit. So we've just had so much good positive energy around a song for Imogene and I'm really proud to see it every time we get to sit and watch it at a film festival um, or you know meet with someone like you to talk about the project it just warms my heart and makes me really proud of the process of making the project as well. As the lead character though Christy you mentioned this a second ago and you touched on it but I want to delve into this have you gotten feedback from people who were in Cheyenne's shoes have you gotten people, victims of domestic violence, uh, folks like that come through and say, thank you. Thank you for bringing this out to light. You're giving us a voice. Yes, absolutely. Um, Erica touched on this a little bit, but in every single screening, there's always someone. And it, it may not be someone that looks like me. It may not be a young woman. Sometimes it's a man. Sometimes it's um, an elderly person, you know, who has experienced the kind of subtle emotional manipulation that this film explores. I think it's important to let viewers know, people who haven't seen the movie yet, that abuse is not so black and white. Um, and Erica does a really beautiful job in the writing of this project to really portray what it's like to be gaslit and what it's like to have these, you know, subtle, um, these like subtle cycles of emotional and mental manipulation that sometimes you can't put your finger on if you can actually define it as abuse. But people watching this film finally feel like they can put their finger on what happened to them. And they're, maybe it's their current experience, maybe it's a past experience that becomes validated in a way. They are seen and they felt heard watching this film because they realize that it's okay um, it starts cathartic conversations, and it's been a really healing process, even for members of our crew um, who, who have had an Alex, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The antagonist is called Alex in the movie, and so we've had a lot of, I would say, more than one at every screening so far to come up to us to say, this is my story too, and um, I've never seen myself portrayed or my situation portrayed on camera, and thank you. Thank you for making this movie. There are nuances in it. You know, the, the, the scene where you're, you're in the closet and, and you're getting the money out and, and all the other times when you're trying to escape. But what, what got me was the look in your eye as that character. Because it's a cross of fear. It's a cross of determination. And it's a cross of pardon the language, but what the hell am I going to do now? You know what I mean? And, and the look in your eye, I think, sold it to me. This is just John Evans here. Sold it to me over and above a lot of the other things you were doing, specifically in that scene. And I wanted to compliment you because there's not everybody that can sell it with their eyes. And to me, you did. Oh, thank you, John. I, that, that means a lot. I appreciate hearing that kind of feedback. Um, Yesterday, we were taking a road trip to Raleigh. We were shooting another project, and Erica and I were having a conversation about what we love about filmmaking versus theater, and that kind of reminds me of that. Um, growing up, I did a lot of stage acting, and it wasn't until I was 17 years old that I discovered filmmaking, and what I appreciate so much about it is the subtleties of these these little bitty micro movements and blocking mm -hmm. and you know the way you can invoke emotion without really saying anything that's something that is just so beautiful um, in filmmaking and I think that kind of acting and that kind of subtlety it's probably written in the script you know that Cheyenne glances to the door in this way and at this point I don't remember but that's part of our branding as Honeyhead is those those like real human experiences being captured mm -hmm. on screen um, yeah. to just tell emotionally generous stories that people can relate to and that are believable and authentic. Yeah, but if you can talk with your eyes, that to me is a gift and a talent. And again, it's John's takeaway, but that's what really kind of jumped off the screen to me 
specifically in that scene. I thought it, I thought it was a great piece of work by you. Uh, Erica, this started as a seven-page script. <laughs> how, how did it blossom? Yeah. How did it blossom into something so large and so uh, just so magnificent? Well, I think short short form narratives and short scripts and films, um, they kind of are their own medium. And oftentimes when I write short films, um, I try to figure out where in the lifespan and the, of a conflict with a character this action is happening. And I often like to leave it open-ended because I think short films are sort of meant to be these what if, and they kind of just like roll the dice for you as an audience member and they kind of put you in a character's shoes for a brief few minutes and then leave you with a lot of questions maybe to, that you might answer even about your own life and your own experience if you were able to connect with the characters in that short amount of time. Um, so when we decided we wanted to turn this into a feature film, I had to figure out where in the plot of a 90 minute film those seven minutes happened. Um, and because I had sort of written in that, in those seven pages, a pretty critical turning point, um, for the relationship of the sisters and the relationship to their house and their mother and the relationship of the character of Cheyenne, who was then called Carla, um, to her partner, her boyfriend, who's not, who's not seen, he's only discussed, um, I sort of realized that that was probably, I probably had written already um, kind of the climactic moment of the film or something near to that. So I had to take it, really unravel everything, unravel the fabric of those characters and think about how they got to that moment um, and explore them and then explore, of course, the resolution afterwards. So it was a really fun process. Um, the, the writing process, I really, in earnest started writing the script in 2020 when the pandemic happened because um, everything shut down. So I was able to take you had a the full time. seven days, <laughs> a whole week. Yeah. I mean, I had the gift of time truly and um, was able to sit down for seven days straight at my desk and flesh out a first draft of the screenplay. And it changed a lot um, in the, in the years following before we filmed the, the movie in the summer of 2022. But that was, you know, the first inception of it was in April of 2020. Um, and a lot of it had to do with finding the right actors, um, finding the right actor to play Alex, to play Cheyenne's partner was really, really important to us before we knew we could make the film. I knew we had to have the actor to play that character so that he could have the nuance to play with all of the gray matter in between um, mm -hmm. in an abusive relationship. Like Christy was saying, we didn't want it to be so polarized. Um, either everything's great or someone's getting physically beaten. Um, there's a lot, a lot that of confu sort of, like I was saying, there's, there's a gray scale there. Um, right. So, and I think that's where things often, people don't realize they're in those situations. Um, bystanders, people who could be allies to, Victims and survivors don't realize it because it's not what we're shown. <laughs> we're not. We're only shown relationships when they get to that, to that point of physical abuse. Usually in media. Um, so it was important to find an actor who could, um, who, Christy trusted, and they trusted each other, and um, that could go go in and, and explore all of the nuance that 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 antagonist had. So when we found that actor through working on another project, I knew, I then wrote the role for him. I wrote Christy's role for her, and then we auditioned the sister um, through a more traditional casting process, which is how we found Mackenzie. So that's kind of how the script came together, was um, pretty, pretty organically. Um, and there were a lot of discoveries along the way. When you're producing a film, um, you also sometimes have to adjust the script for locations or for budgets constraints or just for you know what actors give you after their cast so um, it's a really fun and exploratory process the writing process and I enjoy it a lot I, I was just going to tack on Erica I think it's fun to mention that with the short film 
we toured it around the festival circuit as well, um, primarily in the Southeast. And the audience reaction was always so enthusiastic with the project. They wanted to know, and they'd come up to us after and say, what happens next? We want to know more about these sisters. Are you going to make this a feature? And so when it came time where we felt ready to put on a feature length production, this was the natural choice because there was already an audience fascination with the two sisters and with these authentic Southern characters. And we had a built-in audience already. So it's, it's kind of like trust your gut and read the room, you know, yeah. when you're thinking about turning something into a feature, what is there a demand for in your That's own personal it. following? That's got to be cool, though, when you, I mean, like, it's almost like a book, an author who writes one book and all of a sudden somebody else wants another story from James Bond or whatever the character is. To create that want and desire for more is what a lot of us get into the people business for, to, to mm -hmm. inform or to entertain. And to have that built in and somebody come up and say, okay, what's next? What are you going to do? How are you going to yeah. entertain me next? has to be really... Yeah a cool feeling yeah i'm i'm it's it was surprising to be to be honest because i wrote the short film for christy and i to play sister so i played the sister the janelle character in the short film um because i was more focused on acting at that time um and right. so we just had gotten to know each other as friends and as colleagues and actresses and we were like wouldn't it be so fun to play some like real, authentic, gritty female characters because we never get to audition for those types of roles. And um, it's always sort of these one-dimensional waitress or the hot girl at the party or the nagging <laughs> girlfriend or whatever. And so it's like, I mean, truly, <laughs> hot girl number one at the party. Um, so <laughs> Girl, that, number, girl number one, girl number two, is that what you're saying? Right, girl yeah. number one, girl number two, you know, and so we just really wanted to play some women with depth and breadth and, and women that we knew, you know, that we had grown up around. Right. Um, and so I wrote this film and we shot it on no budget, one hot day in August in rural southeastern North Carolina, not really thinking anything would come of it, to be totally honest. I mean, and like Christy said, we were a little surprised by the audience demand for these characters because they were just they were just for us. We really did it for us mm -hmm. and to fulfill a need that we saw and a gap we saw in our industry. And then when we took it out to festivals, we realized, oh, a lot of other people see and feel this gap as well. And it seemed, and maybe we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. I often get asked sometimes, um, what's the favorite story that you've covered? What's the f most favorite story that I've done? And I've been in this business now 40 years. I can't remember exactly all of them. But I'm going to ask you a similar question, Erica. Of all of the awards in the positive press, world premiere in Bentonville, best feature film at the Rhode Island Film Festival, sold out two at Kukaloris in your hometown, best narrative feature at the Oxford Film Festival. Does one of those mean any more on a higher shelf in Erica's home there than the others? Or is it all just, hey, thank you, good night? <laughs> I mean, all of those experiences and festivals have been such a blessing. Um, I mean, our hometown premiere at Kukaloris really stands out for me, selling out Bailey and Hall and then selling out our follow-up screening at Django's. Um, you know, with people still waiting in line on standby to try to get in. Um, and the reception there, people cheering, people cheered for us. Like, that was amazing. That was such a wonderful feeling. And especially because not just this film, I mean, we did, this film is crowdfunded. So, um, you know, in part. And so it really was, our community owns this film as much as we do in certain ways um, and was such a huge part of making this happen. Um, so we owe a lot to the Wilmington community and then the Honeyhead community at large, which, you know, goes from New York to California. So um, we, I think just bringing it back here to the community that, that really championed our creative careers from the inception of Honeyhead and being able to give them something that is an award-winning film and reflects the work that comes out of our region, it reflects crew and talent from our region and locations, um, you know, that are right in our backyard was really just such a, such a momentous occasion and really something that I'll always remember, um, you know, sitting in that theater and feeling 
feeling proud, um, you know, not just of Christy and myself for what we did, but for everyone who was there um, mm -hmm. and getting to celebrate that moment with with us, really. Um, so that that was a truly that was like one for the that was one for the shelf. Yeah, for sure. That's that's that was that was really beautiful. OK, Christy, I love I'm what you said, Erica, about I'm sorry, John, I just no, wanna, go ahead. I just no. want to jump in about the community owning the film. I think that's so beautiful and so truthful. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Erica that the Kukaloris premiere, nothing will ever top that. It was just, you know, a night to remember. Um, having our entire cast and crew up there on stage with us was just such a beautiful experience. And um, what has followed since November has been really beautiful as well because this community does recognize the talent and they recognize that the film is of high quality, but not just by a Wilmington standard because it's winning awards in other festivals and other markets, you know, playing in competition at Atlanta, winning an award at Oxford. Mm -hmm. Those were all those those experiences also belong to that community too. And so it's been equally as rewarding to just keep seeing how far it's going um, and how far this little movie that could can make it. It's just every time there's an update, I can't wait to share with the community at large. Okay, that's gonna dovetail into my next question, uh, Christy. And if it's unfair, it's unfair, I'm sorry. You both have had such belief in this, but there had to have been maybe one moment when you both recognized that this thing was being, that the response was more than you thought it was going to be. And you may be on stage went, holy crap, can you believe this? There has to be that moment that maybe you think back and maybe it was doing better than you thought it might have been. What was that? I think for me, um, it was when we got into Atlanta Film Festival. Um, I remember calling Erica on the phone. I checked my email right before I left the office one day and I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely in shock. Um, Atlanta's a really big deal. It's one of the biggest festivals in the South, you know, Atlanta being a huge city for cinema and then a cultural hub of talent for film and for music and all kinds of, you know, different creative industries. The energy at that festival, we just got back uh, last week, I think, Monday, Erica, you got back, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's still, it's still just like a shock in, in my book. Um, we were able to share the experience with some of our producers and some of our cast that came to join us there. Um, but just getting accepted to a, a large tier festival like that with this small, small film, relatively speaking, um, and what, what the programmer said in their email to us was that they believe that our film is what cinema should be, and they want to expose their audience to these authentic stories that represent real people. And they really just wow. got it. You know, How when you just cool find your audience, it was an amazing, um, you know, I should just print the email because it just like, it like put a little feather in my cap. I just felt, I felt really um, at home in that way there. I'd print that email and yeah. put that up, hang that up on the, I in think the, we'll, in the I think office. we'll do that. We'll frame it. We'll stick it up there with the trophy. Yeah. Awesome Oxford, that, but, uh, that a, yeah. A, a community like that and the description of why they wanted it hand in glove with what you guys were trying to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It felt like the, the film found a perfect audience and a home um, at this festival that really appreciates these kinds of movies. And it was 3% of features that get selected. There's there's thousands, literally like over a thousand movies that get submitted and their programming team watches every single one and they only picked 30 and one of them was a song wow. for Emma Jean. Uh, so to be able to screen so in awesome. competition there, I just, I was really proud and, and surprised, frankly. I, you know, we, we shot for the stars as far as like trying to get it into these festivals um, and at some point you think ah, probably won't get into it but we should try anyway and so we were feeling really excited by that yeah mm -hmm. and I mean you know secrets exposed here last year when I submitted a podcast for a Merle award never thought it would win I said why not you know what I mean same thing and then all of a sudden when you get that notification that one-on-one -on -one with John Evans Michelle Lee and the very Asian movement wins a regional Murrow, it's like, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's probably that same kind of 
vindication, I think, is the word that I used when I got that. And I get that sense from, from your answer there that it was a vindication of good work by us. Truly, yes, and, our, and the people who came along with us to make it possible. Erica, Imogene, in my mind, is another example of Wilmington's strong indie film community. You had Hannah Black and Megan Peterson release Drought a couple of years ago. Uh, J.R. Rodriguez released Remember Yesterday, got a distribution deal. What makes this film community so strong in your mind? You know, we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of people still are, aren't aware of Wilmington. I think we, we fly under the radar sometimes, but the film industry has been here for a while. Um, and so I think that there is a sense of legacy here and a lot of really talented people who like to live and work in this community. And we're fortunate to have the infrastructure to support, to support big projects that, um, you know, help with workforce development and help with keeping people here. And I think that there has been, so this type of community has attracted people that want to also create and tell stories. And I think because there still is a gap that we're trying to fill for these kind of lower tier, lower budget projects, these kind of mid, mid, I, what the industry would consider low budget, like a one to $7 million project or something. We're really trying to, to fill the gap with, you know, with Wilmington projects and with local projects. And I think that there is a push for that amongst the independent film community. And, um, and then you just have a lot of really talented people here. There's resources here. I think people that are educated, that understand the industry, that understand the impact that independent film can have. And, and I think because we are a small but mighty film community, I think people understand that you don't just have to be a cog at a machine in order to work and live in this industry. And um, so I feel really fortunate to be here, um, you know, to have worked on drought. Christy and I both worked on drought with Hannah and Megan back when they were making that film. And it was really an inspirational um, achievement that they had, you know, yeah. with how they made that happen. And um, so I think it's just a magical little place. Um, more and more we're getting discovered. I feel like Wilmington shows up on every like Southern Living magazine um, where you should move in the South. You know, what I mean? um, so also like write the best the best coming. cities to live and work as a filmmaker. It's on those lists yeah. too. People are are realizing get, that as well. On those lists. Dovetailing it a little bit here more, and you two met strangely enough on Craigslist. Uh, I think uh, that's a fascinating story. And when you tell people we met on Craigslist, it's not usually a business meeting on Craigslist many times, but that's how the two of you got together, right, Christy? This is true. You've really done your research, John. I'm impressed. Uh, I try um, to do. Oh, I've, the got Craigslist. More, I've got more here, believe <laughs> <Yeah>. me. Yeah. <laughs> the Craigslist casting call is what we call it, this like faded day. Um, I actually moved to Wilmington in late 2014 as did erica and she decided that she was going to write and direct her first short film she comes from a theater background so she put a casting call on craigslist god knows why and i new to the area was looking for some acting work i, I wouldn't recommend it to any young actresses out there it was a, just a different time you know the early right. 2000s in that way um but I do remember the feeling of submitting for the project and getting my sides, so the audition materials, um, and reading a script that was written by a woman for the first time. And I remember how different it felt. I remember that the characters finally had depth and dimension and that the dialogue felt like something I would actually say. Um, and I was so excited to be cast in Erica's movie because everything was done online. I had no idea that she was my age, that she would become my best friend and my business partner and my maid of honor and, you know, like the auntie to my babies and like all of the legacy of our life that has happened in the last 10 years. I had no clue. I thought she was like many years my senior by the way she presented um, just through email, but we met that day on set and had an instant friendship. We became fast friends and eventually roommates and then started our company after she wrote that short film that we were talking about um, earlier in, on the podcast. And 
so Honeyhead was just born from like an organic experience of realizing that there was more to it, that we wanted to write our own narrative and pave our own way. And no one was going to give us these opportunities. We just needed to make them for ourselves. And how about this for research? If you want to know more about the origins of this friendship, you can go to another podcast called Raw Unfiltered Honey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. That that's was a, that we had a lot of fun with that one. That was that's that a one it's was, it's a fun was, listen, was ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you. <laughs> I'm so I'm so happy you listened to it, John. That's awesome. It gave me a background into the friendship and how your friendship developed. And and that was cool to listen to. And and not everybody can put that out there, popping a, a, a bottle of wine and just having two microphones and just talking. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of our success as a company has really been our transparency and our authenticity as as women, you know, and just lifting the veil and saying, we're figuring it out as well. Come along on the journey. That's been a, a part of why we've been so successful, I think. Would you agree, Erica? Yeah, I think we've never we've never come at, uh, you know, the industry or anything like that from a place of trying to trying to keep it elusive what we're doing you know i think we've always just been ourselves and we've always been um you know striving to create transparency where we felt like we didn't have any um and you know as young people i think a lot of the gatekeepers you know out in hollywood like to keep things you know they like to shelter um you know the resources and the knowledge that they have and we're we're big advocates of lifting while climbing um, and when we get to the door, holding it open for other people to come in. So I think that's just part of our brand. We've always just been ourselves, you know. We didn't go to film school, you know, so we just are self-taught um, in this way that um, I think just allows for that. And people like people like to see that because it makes it feel a little less daunting. An industry that has historically been um, pretty sheltered from the rest of the world, um, I think it, it just helps to... to live in that state of authentic, um, you know. Erica, is this what you wanted to do when you went to UNC Chapel Hill? I wanted to own a theater company. Um, so that was my goal going into college was, so kind of an adjacent, um, I guess, career goal. Um, but I was very much a purist about theater um, when I was at Chapel Hill. I, I, um, I was like, this is the, the oldest, you know, the classical uh, form of performance and acting and directing and writing. I was really into stage. Um, and then I took uh, acting for the camera class when I was a senior and it shifted my mindset a little bit on um, how important and impactful, um, you know, actually camera work can be. Um, so that that really shifted my perspective. And um, yeah, I moved down to Wilmington to pursue working in um, some local community theaters and started um, auditioning and, um, you know, doing more camera classes. And I just sort of fell in love with the intimacy that you can find through cinema. Um, but no, I originally wanted to be in theater. Um, so I so I took kind of a, I would say a parallel jump mm -hmm. um, into the film industry. And I've been learning a lot since then. Christy, did you see yourself as a business owner and an actress at New Bern High School when you were up there in Craven County? Absolutely not. Um, I've been preparing a, a talk for the Rotary Club about this, and I've been reflecting on it this week. I never imagined when I was 17 and I graduated New Bern High School and moved to Los Angeles to chase this kind of impossible dream of being a movie star that I would eventually be an entrepreneur and you know, have a very fulfilling career as a multi-hyphenate creative person. So not just an actress, but I'm equally as fulfilled being the person who's putting the project together from the start to finish and collaborating um, on something to give myself an opportunity uh, as an actress. I, I didn't see that as a path. And I think that's part of the impetus of Honeyhead is that as young women, we didn't really see other women in directing roles, in producing roles as cinematographers or editors, uh, creating the story and the narrative. We saw girls play hot number two girl at the party. And we saw all of these kind of wafy model -y type women, you know, playing teenagers in high school when they're like in their 30s. And so there was nothing authentic about what we were looking at um, from 
from a cinematic standpoint or television or in movies that really felt relatable. And I think a lot of that had to do with women not being in, in the position of being decision makers in Hollywood. When we founded our company in 2014 or when we met on Craigslist, women only only accounted for like 14% of creative decision makers at all in Hollywood. Uh, those statistics haven't changed very much since we started Honeyhead, but it's a huge reason why we keep going. Why the name Honeyhead, Christy? What's the significance of that for the public to understand? This one always, this one always is, is fun. It's, um, have, well, John, you know, you're not a woman. So I would say, <laughs> have you ever been oh honeyed? But you're from the South. Maybe you've honeyed somebody before and not oh, meant it. I, but, I, I, uh, had it often, I had it growing up. I mean, aunts, uncles, or my aunt, my grandmother, I mean, they would, they would say that, you know? Exactly, right? It's like dismissive in this way. Uh, oh, honey, I got it. Don't pick that up. It's kind of too heavy. Or, oh, honey, just sit back. Let me take care of it. We really wanted to reclaim what it meant to be a honey. Um, Eric and I are both two blonde women, and we wanted to 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 put a new spin on what that meant as young young women in the industry that we can have a certain sweetness in the way that we project ourselves to the world the way that we treat our crew and our cast and our company culture it has it has a certain sweetness to it but we're also you know quite smart and wise and and um, very driven people and so we wanted to just reclaim what that meant and also there's there's a little fun alliteration there. Um, and we landed on just a gold mine of branding with our hive, you know, and all of the, the bees. We call our interns the little bees and mm -hmm. the community of support, you know, is the collective proverbial hive um, in in Honeyhead land. I'm here at the Honey headquarters, our office. So, you know, That's it's cool. been like a really fun journey. It was the only name that was ever thrown out when we decided we needed to brand our production company. Um, I'm glad it, it stuck, but it was just the first and only suggestion, and I think it works really well. Erica, I heard Christy say in an interview, again, I do my research here. I heard her say, sometimes they just want to check the box to get honey hit in the door, and we can feel that. What's that feeling like, Erica? Can you describe it? There's a difference between, you know, talking about Honeyhead as a female-owned company um, in a traditionally male industry. I think you can you can feel when someone is just checking a box. We put a woman on camera, you know, on screen in a film, but all the decision makers above the line, you know, are still men. And that, that can swing both ways, you know, for people of color, you know, people of different, you know, LGBTQ plus, like you can, and different abilities, you can kind of feel that when, um, when people are being put on screen to check a box, but it's not, but the actual storytellers and the people making decisions of what happens with budgets and financing and crewing um, and the real creative minds behind projects, you can tell when they're just kind of checking a box to make sure that they're meeting a mandate. Um, so it's really important to us, you know, to champion projects that are kind of walking the walk <laughs> in this way and not just talking the talk. It's, as far as that goes, um, it's really important to us. And, and you can, because like you said, you can feel that. You can feel when um, when it's, when you're just a box and you're walking on set and pe you're kind of there to, um, so that people can feel good. And, you know, but then sometimes you're just still overlooked, but it looks good on someone that you're there <laughs> as a woman, but you're still so overlooked and maybe not listened to. Um, and I've had to advocate for myself, um, even as a director or a leader on set, um, amongst, you know, often male colleagues, I've had to still advocate for myself um, to, because there's just an assumption, especially with technical skills in our industry, that um, women just aren't as well equipped um, or don't have the same base knowledge or skill set um, as men. So I think that I think you can definitely feel it, but you know, the times are changing and we like to stay really positive and just include people in our sets that want to champion different, um, different folks. So we, we work with lots of different people. We work, you know, we work with men all the time. You know, it's just people, people that care, you know, that care about diversifying our industry, you know? So um, that's really the mandate that we try to push forward or, or you know, 
people, you know, marginalized voices and then allies. Has there been any moment since you two founded Honeyhead Films that you may have second guessed it? That you may have said, oh man, what did we do? I think any entrepreneur and small business owner has had that that moment that, you know, oh, crap, what have I done? Um, you know, I think when you take that big step um, into into founding your own business, because um, really, you know, we're in a creative industry. We are artists, but we were we were kind of creatives first and then realized that we had to become business owners. Um, right. So that so we were we were filmmakers and then we realized that we wanted to make it a business. And so I think that taking the first step um, into that world, you know, is shaky ground. Um, and we were, you know, Christy and I, we were living together at the time and, you know, living well below our means in order to make that work. Um, you know, and I think that it, it was hard, honestly, you know, getting imaging off the ground was, was a big lift for us because we were already independently operating as Honeyhead as a company producing other projects. And then we took on another startup, which was our film. So we were a startup who then took on a second startup that wasn't making any um, financial return for our company. Um, so that was a that was a big lift. Um, so talking about, you know, as creatively, it was really fulfilling. But if you're talking about from a business standpoint, it was a huge lift um, yeah. to make that film happen and develop it and pre prep it and then shoot it. Um, you know, kind of like all riding on the backbone of Honeyhead. So our divi our attention was kind of divided in between our Honeyhead as a business, you know, producing fine, you know, projects that were financially viable and then getting this other startup off the ground that was imaging that hadn't proven its worth in the marketplace yet. So um, that was a big learning curve for us. Um, and, and like I said, a, a pretty big lift as a company. Um, so you know, it was an exciting time, but um, it was definitely um, sort of a little bit of an intimidating moment, you know, as as entrepreneurs and as small business owners, like I was saying. OK. The top performing artist in the world right now is Taylor Swift. Caitlin Clark took the country by storm in the NCAA women's basketball tournament, raised WNBA or raised the, the final four to huge ratings. Uh, Greta Gerwig directed the highest grossing film last year, Barbie. All super successful women leading parts of society today. Why then do women only account for 26% of entertainment related jobs? Is this a turning point, do you think? Do I would hope so. Yeah, I would, I would truly hope that we're seeing a shift. I think that female leaders that are able to shake it up, um, specifically, you know, monetarily, I think that the powers that be, you know, they want to see numbers behind, um, you know, what drives, what drives that. <laughs> so they want to see, it's really exciting to me that you have Greta Gerwig coming out, Taylor Swift coming out, Beyonce coming out, you know, on these like, kind of mega tours of their own art um, and driving economic growth and development um, in their industries is really exciting to me um, because again, that's what people are looking for when they're, if you really want to get down to it and you're not talking about a moral landscape and you know, and a diversity landscape, if you're really just talking brass tacks and numbers, then women are proving to do that as well. <laughs> so that's, right. Really to me, and I hope that the that people continue continue to put um, women in positions of decision making power, creative power, and respecting them as people that can um, not just tell interesting stories and create viable art, but like like I said, drive economic impact because um, that's really what's going to convince the powers that be to um, let women have a seat at the table. What about you, Christy? What do you think about this possible turning point in these industries and in society, really? I'll add to that that it really comes down to two things. Um, it's the consumers who 
are proving that female-led work is commercially viable, whether that's in sports or music or, you know, filmmaking and the cinema experience that we're talking about today, showing up at the box office, turning on your television, getting those user ratings high, um, those viewer ratings, we need to prove that we care about what women are doing in the world. And the other thing that comes to mind as Erica and I are pitching our next project, which is a female-led post-apocalyptic action thriller, mm -hmm. we are coming up against, I wouldn't say against, but I'd say um, we're coming up on a lot of really interesting information about making sure that th that there is a female DP, there is a female director, it is written by a woman. It's, as far as filmmaking goes, these Hollywood A-list actresses, they don't want to work on projects necessarily unless there's an, a woman attached in some capacity. It's now, it's now kind of like a make or break for them. And so we find ourselves um, in a position of extreme leverage at this point because so many women are realizing on the heels of like the Me Too movement and um, all the negative things that we've had to overcome as women, but also all the wonderful stories that are being told and discovered by female voices, they're all gravitating towards these projects. And so they're getting the green light when they attach a female director um, or a female writer comes up with a great script that is able to attract A-list female talent to the project. So coming from a, a star-driven perspective and the consumer-driven perspective, those working in tandem are just going to keep furthering this agenda, which I feel really passionate about. Okay, Christy, you were front and center on a feature film that is getting awards all across the country. Who's one person you worked with or you met that got you tongue-tied, that you had difficulty maybe speaking to or nervous about or starstruck? <laughs> The only person that comes to mind, Erica was actually here for this situation um, several years ago. Is this what you're asking me? Like, when have I ever been starstruck? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Several years ago, we were touring a different film. Um, we were actually in Atlanta at, at a, a movie convention. And this was right, I guess it was 2018 or 2017 or so, right around the time when Stranger Things first came out, maybe season one, I don't think season two had been released yet and we're we're at a booth selling this film you know dvd copies of a movie and across the room there's a booth set up for the, the children who star in stranger things and i at the time just so endearingly loved the character of dustin of toothless and um when i went to go talk to him and meet him i just started crying and I just, I just was so emotional because he's a wonderful actor, but he's also an activist. Um, I, I'm, I'm like blanking on what, what kind of health condition he has where his teeth are actually like, they don't, that's like real, right? Like I, I love the story that those, those creators of the show loved him as a character so much. They based the character around who he was and his disability as a human. And I found that so inspiring that he never lost sight of his, of his dream, you know, and that like he was making this happen. And he's also just like so deserving of this success. I just started weeping and I was just telling him how proud I was of him. And he, he touches my shoulder and he says, don't cry lady, it's okay. And he gave me a hug. I walk back to the booth to Erica and I'm literally like speechless. Like I didn't even know what to say, but I think oh. I just became so overwhelmed by his success story that I got choked up. It's less about like, I can't believe it's him in the flesh. It was just so inspiring to see his success at that moment in his career that I, uh, myself trying to express that to him, it just came out as like a little warbly weep. <laughs> that That's a great story. Okay, Erica, same thing to you. Who's somebody that you got starstruck around? Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think, I mean, we got to see Gina Davis at um, Bentonville Film Festival because that's her film festival. Um, you know, and I grew up on, G on Gina Davis movies. I mean, like The Long Kiss Goodnight um, with her and Samuel is like a family staple for me. Um, so 
you know, I loved her as like a powerful woman, you know, in the industry who then took initiative to make her own film festival. And um, in order to showcase work, you know, by women, um, I think that that was a really inspirational moment for me to just see her out there doing her thing and see her in real life after I'd seen her kind of kicking butt and, you know, on, on screen for so long growing up, you know, and kind of being this powerhouse for women, especially at a time when that wasn't really happening as much, you know, you weren't seeing Charlize Theron in like every other action movie, you know, I think that it felt like Gina was coming in a time when that wasn't as common. Um, so that was really inspirational for me to see her. And then at, at the same festival, we saw a, a wonderful film um, called Fresh Kills. It's a feature film. The writer and director is an actress um, named Jennifer Esposito, and she was there for the Q&A. And seeing her after watching her incredible performance and incredible direction of that film for the Q&A was also had me a little starstruck because it was so inspiring, um, her story behind that project and how she um, she's a, a well-known actress and um, a regular on, you know, network television and things like that and um, still had a really hard time getting her first film financed. Um, you know, it was not a walk in the park for her and she overcame a lot of obstacles in order to make her film happen because the industry was like, we want to keep you as an actress. You're not a writer director. And so she said, well, I'm just going to pave my own way. So anytime I see a woman like that um, going out and doing her own thing, I always get, um, you know, my heart just swells, but I also just have such admiration for these women who are, you know, like we're trying to do, they're paving a way. So they're just trying to make the path a little easier for the women that come behind them. So anytime I see a woman doing that, I get pretty, um, pretty excited. But yeah, seeing Gina in real life, she's as tall as she looks on screen. Um, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> I imagine watching Christie's interaction with the young man from Stranger Things was probably pretty funny to watch too, wasn't it? That's pretty fun. They were they were great, those kids. Oh yeah, they're awesome. That's funny uh, because we all have those we all have those things. Even being on the big screen, being on the small screen, there are still some of those people who just kind of get your "Am I worthy?" kind of thing. You know, I think it's fun. Yeah, for What's, sure. What's next for Honeyhead Films, Erica? Uh, you, I think you mentioned it, or, or Christy mentioned uh, you have another feature film that you're working on, but what's, what's tops on your to-do list? Yeah, the, so well, as Christy mentioned, we're working on another project called Host Country. It's um, a bit of a diversion from imaging from a genre standpoint. It's a post-apocalyptic action thriller. So um, very different, but still a female-led cast and a very character-driven film. Um, so that we're and we're hoping to turn that into um, a two-part theatrical experience so a two-part feature and um, potentially also leverage the ip to um, work into maybe a series of some kind so we're kind of thinking big picture on the next project which is really exciting um, and then we also are and we also have a lot of smaller projects going on or other projects that are in development so um, it's it's fun to kind of look back and do a retrospective on Honeyhead and where it's all come from. Um, and I feel really grateful to be in a place where I'm mostly developing projects now and doing a lot of writing, um, whether it's for other people, adaptations. Um, I'm working on a couple adaptations right now and a couple other original screenplays. But our, our next feature project is really at top of mind right now. Um, we're actively packaging it with with our producer who's attached right now so um that's really exciting and that all happened because of imaging um we met our producer for this project at the premiere so it's all um it it, it all kind of snowballs you know in in this industry like so many others you know your network keeps growing and the doors keep opening so we're just really grateful um to have this project as kind of imaging's our calling card film now so when people see and they see what we can do we can do a lot with a little and it makes them trust us to take the next step and make the next project um, even bigger and better. Well, in case you ever need uh, to do any research, if you're developing something about a, uh, a veteran news anchor who's trying to stay current in the changing media landscape, uh, just drop me an email. We can I can share some thoughts and if you ever want, <laughs> if you ever want to develop a, <laughs> anything like that in the with a with an anchor who's uh, who's been around for a while, just give me a shout. I'll be more than, ha more than happy to talk about it with you. 
there's always a story to be told. Um, there are, so, there are... yeah, we'll definitely, we have, we have the dramaturge right here in front of us right now. <laughs> Christy, when can, when will the general public be able to see a song for Imogene? Uh, I'm so glad you asked, John. We have several more regional film festivals lined up throughout the rest of the year. Next, we're playing in Asheville um, on the 26th of May, um, and we'll be playing all across the state. Um, up until probably November will be our last film festival. Um, and we uh, have received several offers for distribution for the movie. And today, we're actually meeting with the distributor we've decided to go with. Um, so I don't have an exact answer, but please continue to follow Honeyhead. Uh, we'll let you know, John, when the film becomes public and when the release date is, so you can blast your followers as well. But it definitely will be available via streaming um, and you know on demand for anyone in their, in their home. And I want to say for anybody locally here in Wilmington, we understand that a lot of you weren't able to get tickets to Kukuloris or you you missed the screening entirely, maybe you were out of town. There's been a lot of people asking to see the film here. Um, and through that distribution deal, we're going to maintain theatrical rights to the movie. So we'll have the ability to screen it in Wilmington whenever we like. And we plan to put it up in a theater pretty soon, probably, um, I would say this summer when things slow down a little bit. We're kind of busy through the month of May, but maybe June or July we'll be hosting a screening. We'll also let you know about that, John, so, so people can come out and enjoy this beautifully homegrown film. I was talking about it with my wife this morning. I told her I was talking to you two, and she said, well, where can I see it? I said, that's the thing, Sheila, it's still making the rounds on the festival. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a topic that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, obviously, uh, people have high regards for it. Rotten Tomatoes gave it a great score. You've gotten critical acclaim all across the country. Erica Arley and Christy Ray, you're two of the most talented filmmakers in southeastern North Carolina, co-founders of Honeyhead Films. The cool thing about this is, is I'm going to be able to say I had them on the podcast when, before they blew up and before they became huge. Erica and Christy, thanks for taking the time. You guys are so busy. I appreciate you taking the time and sitting down for my one-on-one -on -one podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I truly enjoyed it. Thank you, John. This has been a, this has been a real pleasure. It's so it's so nice to um, to just get to sit down and take some time um, and reflect. I think it's it's really nice what you're doing, and this has been a great conversation. A big thank you to Erica Arley and Christy Ray for taking time out of their very busy schedule and joining me for this week's podcast interview. You can learn more about their company, Honeyhead Films, by going to honeyheadfilms.com, and you can learn more about their first feature-length film, the award-winning A Song for Imogene. You can go to imogenemovie.com. And you can also follow them on social media. They're very active on Instagram and other social media platforms. Now, before we go, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please follow and subscribe to the One-on-One -on -one with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. We really do care what you think about our interviews. And the more reviews and ratings we have from friends like you, the higher we'll be listed on those apps the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of One on One.